Uh, it is a pleasure to participate in this all women uh, roundtable, I must confess. And it was great to listen to you, Eliko, yesterday. I will for sure continue to read your work. I started to do that. Uh, and it is great to be here with uh, this invitation from Irina and Marta and uh, Anna that I really admire uh, their work. Uh, so what I'm trying to do here, and I, I, I'm trying to do two things. Uh, one of the things I try to share uh, some uh, ideas that I developed uh, during a collective project. It was a project, an European project. Uh, and uh, we did the, it was a conventional project, so to say, uh, about justice in Europe. Uh, but then I tried, now it was a project that was bef between uh, 2017 and 2020. And what I am doing now is uh, reanalyzing some of the data from a post colonial perspective. So I developed a different conceptual uh, framework to analyze that because I felt very much constrained. Uh, in that project. So I'm using some data and analyzing them. Uh, mainly, actually, I'm using some conceptual framework that I developed while I was working on legal pluralism in Mozambique, uh, mainly, and it was a post-colonial approach that uses a lot of concepts from the epistemologies of the South. And what I found, it is, it is very interesting to use it to analyze Europe. It was something that was used mainly to analyze uh, countries outside of Europe, and I find it very interesting uh, to analyze Europe reality. So I start to uh, buy some data from this report that I did with Maria Paula Bles, she was the first author, and with Sylvia Freire, another colleague from SESH, and Barbara Safadin, that it was a colleague from Netherlands. And this project, uh, it involved uh, six countries, uh, Turkey and five uh, European Union countries, uh, Austria, Netherlands, Portugal, uh, Hungary, Hungary, and the uh, UK. And uh, the first report we did, we were supposed to analyze uh, uh, austerity discourses, uh, legal, legal discourses. And what we found it was uh, uh, there was a movement from uh, uh, some discourses on Europe, Europe uh, distinguishing itself as this. Uh, uh, come to, as this place of the European uh, uh, social model, and then he goes and moves into this austerity society model. This austerity society is a concept from one of our colleagues, Antonio Casimir Ferreira, and it's something like uh, <laughs> you require in order for you to put on hold the constitution and the promises of uh, uh, modernity. Legitimation by fear, uh, the, possibility, the legal possibility of having a state of exception, and combining elective power with non-elective power. So looking at it from a perspective of legal pluralism, we could say that we have a global law, that it's the law of the financial, financial markets. And what we saw, is this was a common growth. Uh, for all countries in Europe with very, very different uh, um, results. So the crisis and austerity measures did not hit everyone in the same way, neither did the one-size-fits-all character of the austerity and structural adjustment reforms. So inequalities, we found two kinds of inequalities, inequalities between countries and the countries that experienced more difficulties and harder the regulation policies in welfare and labor rights are those that already experience stronger neoliberal transformations, be it the UK, the Central Eastern European countries, or the Southern European countries, under international investment for neoliberal structural adjustment. Uh, so some countries, even for instance, we did another report on social dialogue structures, and the attacks on social dialogue were much more aggressive in Portugal than in Austria. So in Austria, social dialogue structures could continue to have an important role. But also, Cross countries, and I think maybe this is the thing that uh, dialogues more with this idea of intersectional justice, is because even if it was much more complicated for some countries than from others, there were some groups that were affected, especially targeted across uh, countries. Women, older people, younger migrant, and Roma uh, uh, people. So uh, what we saw this, this it was uh, uh, about considering the discourses, it's not only a technocratic discourse, but a very moralist discourse with, that comes with these technocratic uh, uh, answers. I'm not looking to the 
So, uh, what Antonio Casimiro uh, Ferreira says is that uh, austerity comes with uh, an economic rhetoric based on the idea that it is necessary to reform the state in order to eliminate the state's facts. I'm not sure if this is a different, is a different <laughs> translation, it's the gordura do state's facts. Yeah. In the characterization of citizen behavior as irresponsible, uh, and that it is necessary to give confidence to the financial markets, considering the sources of funding. And this dialogues a lot with one of you, well, quotation that I saw from Enicos in, a, in a, an article that I read, uh, when she says that uh, the EU's civilizational discourses also play a productive role in the creation of subjectivities ready to justify capitalism as the only possible direction to be uh, taken after the collapse of actually existing socialism. So this is a very colonialist uh, approach that it exists uh, inside of Europe, and then you find this civilizational discourses, uh, it is used to distinguish countries and also citizens inside uh, each, each country. So, uh, and already mentioned this, and this was mentioned, there was a rhetoric when uh, Troika intervened uh, in Portugal, Portuguese people lived behind uh, their means, uh, and then we have this uh, chairman of Europe Group in 2007 saying Portugal spends EU cash on wine and women, uh, Portugal should also have duties and can spend their money on women and alcohol and then ask for help. Uh, but in fact, and this is an important thing, I'm bringing some perspectives from artists, and this is a project, a project Troika, that was created, uh, I think, I, I'm not remembering the, 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 I think it was 2016, uh, probably 2017, uh, that showed by pictures and films that uh, uh, what meant to live beyond our means. To live beyond our means in practice or pe was people living in very degradating uh, situation. Uh, was people living actually above the line of uh, uh, dignity, uh, under the line of uh, uh, the minimum standards of, uh, of dignity. So, and then we know what came next, what came next, and I'm joining here different uh, uh, reports. It was uh, these uh, general uh, strikes and protests that exist uh, in Portugal against Troika, uh, and these people united against Troika, it was uh, an international uh, protest uh, that also was felt uh, in Portugal, and all of them pretty much with this discourse of the Occupy Wall Street and of the Indignados that it was the 1% against the 99%. And it is here now that I start mixing reports and doing a different uh, approach to what I did by then. Uh, because when I see in other reports, uh, different reports than this, uh, when we were talking with minority groups, we come to realize that this is a misreading uh, narrative, the one against the 99, because this 99 is very different if we have an intersectional perspective to analyze it. And maybe we should think about this, and we should think why that we turn from these national protests that were uh, mobilizing apparently everyone, and now we are so much divided, we have the populist discourses and we are so vulnerable to extreme rights uh, discourses. Because I think this was a false uh, discourse of what happened, or at least I think, I believe we really need to think by that. So this is uh, one, uh, maybe uh, my colleagues uh, already know this picture, this, uh, uh, this was pretty much uh, circulated pretty much among, the, among us that are attentive to this, uh, to this question. And this is a, a Roman woman, and she has, uh, it says there is a phrase, we are women and gypsy, we exist and we resist. So, and she explained to me in an interview why she felt the need to have that. She said, we need to state, and this is very difficult for me to say, she said, but we need to state that we exist, otherwise we are completely invisible in all this uh, uh, struggle. Um, then I have here, and I'm sorry, this is a very, very large quotation that I bring here, but I think it is important. Uh, it is from uh, uh, Pimen Ferreira, is a Roma activist, and this is from a public, uh, uh, a public speech that he did, and it was about uh, racism and left. And he says something, and he says this, half of the families that live in precarious houses, uh, tents, are gypsy. I'm using gypsy. Don't never know the translation because uh, activists in Portugal don't use Roma, they use Cigano, which is the word with gypsy, but yes. with a different connotation. But 
well, this was the decision and translation. So we spoke here about the 25th of April. So the 25th of April is the date of uh, the uh, revolution and democracy uh, installation in Portugal. So it's called the day is the 25th of April, so it's the 25th of April of 1974. So it's the mark of democracy in Portugal. And it says, we spoke here about the 25th of April. There is a reality before 25th of April and a reality after 25th of April. Before April 25th, we had slums and there were white people in the slums. After the 25th of April, there were measures and concrete political actions and today you have almost no whites in slum neighborhoods. Uh, uh, 0.8% of white people live in precarious house. For the gypsies communities, there is 50%. Half of the Roma community lives in slums. There was no 25th of April for the Roma, nor for the blacks. Of course, among whites, there are the richer and the poorest, but the society are whites and non-whites. We can never forget that. And then he starts talking to the youth. Precariousness? Okay, let's talk about precariousness. Gypsies and black live in precarious conditions for way longer than you. 2008, 2011, the crisis, I just saw. But I live, I'm living in crisis for my entire life, okay? You are going through a bad period. That's a good thing. Now we can talk about it. Uh, it is just like the housing issue in Lisbon, and this is the most important quotation, that's why I choose for us to discuss here. It is just like the housing issue in, in Lisbon now. There is the problem of gentrification, but they forget that gentrification started with racialization with the gypsies and the blacks living outside of the city. And now that the problem reaches the white middle class, the political parties and the political campaigns say housing for the middle class. Um, no, this I will. Uh, and so this is uh, this is this is two academics, uh, but uh, Grossfogel and uh, Julie Suarez Traube. Uh, I, I brought this because in 2013, in the Alice Project, we organized uh, a workshop of the Popular University of Social Movements and Popular University of Social Movements workshop. They bring together people from different movements. The idea is to make this intercultural or political translation, so it's people from different movements, and we have uh, collectives that come from the uh, decolonial groups, anti-racist uh, collectives, with uh, Juventude, Save Futuro, with uh, precarious uh, groups of people, youth people. And it was a very, very uncomfortable discussion. Uh, precisely because there was this uh, idea of these uh, new white kids, this new white left, uh, that were suddenly wanting to uh, continue and mobilize it over the uh, history of struggle that exists in Europe and what the collectives, the decolonial collectives were saying. It was an anti-Islamophobic uh, anti collective who said, we are here for so long time and you never wanted to talk with us. So now you want to talk with us, now that you feel bad, because for us, we are not starting with the problem now. The problem has always uh, uh, existed. So it was very tense, but uh, actually 10 years after that, I started making more sense of it than I did by, uh, uh, by then. So uh, in order, and here is the, I, I go to my concept, it's only one slide, don't worry, uh, but it is large. I'm sorry to my students that are here because you've heard this a lot of times because I, I'm using my students to discuss this conceptual uh, a framework. Uh, so for them, it will not be new. And what I bring is to uh, bring the sociology of law from both into the social science before the epistemologies of the South with the sociology of law of both into the social science, with the sociology of both into the social science after uh, he develops this idea of epistemology of the South. So I don't know any of you are any kind of uh, any uh, familiar with what to, this is a post-colonial approach, but works with three axes of oppression. Uh, there are three main axes of oppression in modern in modern societies: colonialism, heteropatriarchy, and uh, capitalism. Uh, and uh, there is the main concept, there is the abyssal line, but I'm joining another. Uh, the three modes of civil society. So I will explain it. According to this, uh, civil society is divided in three circles. Uh, so you have this intimate circle of civil society. This would be the one percent. This would be the where is the promiscuity between civil society and the state, the group of the privilege. But then you have this strange civil society. This is a medium circle in which you have some rights. 
but uh, there is social contract there, uh, there are inequalities. But then you have this third circle, and this is the uncivil, uh, uncivil civil society. And this is where I bring the epistemologies of the world. I bring this. Uh, between the strange civil society and the uncivil civil society, you have what we call the Arista line. And this is mainly a legal and an epistemological line, uh, 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 let's say. So inside of this, uh, uh, in this strange civil society, you have a modern contract, a modern sort of contract working. But you have like what Hatna Kapoor calls uh, the freedom in a fishbowl. Uh, so you have these liberal rights, you believe the world ends like that, but there's a lot more in the world that you could use if you had a post-colonial uh, lens. Um, on the other side of the line, there is no modern social contract. Uh, so what we have inside is here, you, this is the civilizational, uh, the civilization zone. So maybe you, you don't have rights, but you are recognized. Uh, you are recognized by social contract. You are recognized because you are civil. You are you are a human, basically. Uh, and here, the dynamic between uh, regulation and emancipation, this sociology of welcoming again, uh, works perfectly. On the other side of the line, it is what Franz Fanon called zone of non-being, uh, and. Many times we use the Abyssal line uh, to understand as a geographical line that separates north from the south, but in fact this Abyssal line, it crosses our cities, it crosses uh, our countries. It can divide countries from each other, but it's also a cross-country uh, line. And what I think that we need to bring here, and in order to prospect for an intersectional form of justice, I would say is that on the other side of the line, there is uh, uh, appropriation and violence. Uh, that this is moving to this concept. He says that on this side of the line, you have regulation and emancipation. So you have a dynamic of the, you know, uh, modern instruments have can can ensure you some rights. Law can ensure you some rights in this uh, logic of regulation and emancipation. But on the other side of the line. Law, there is no social contract, there is no law. The only thing that exists is appropriation and violence. This is the colonial zone, or this would be the colonial zone, and with continuities until the present. But what it is important here it is that we don't have just to give rights to people, we need to do much more than that. In order to rebuild the society, we need to think this not only as a legal uh, line, but an epistemological line. Because, in fact, there is not only appropriation and violence on the other side of the line. It exists a lot of things that we need to reconsider uh, the future of societies. Uh, from the, post, from the legal, uh, legal police perspective, I would say we have the law of the oppressed, so different kinds of social contracts. You have plural conceptions of nature, you have plural conceptions of economy, you have plural conceptions of what family is, other conceptions of dignity, modes of, other conceptions of modes of production, not only capitalism, but different modes of production, uh, other forms of democracy. So basically, what you have uh, on this side of the line, so in the middle, you would have the criterion of validation that validates only the knowledge that it's important for the development of capitalism and to the continuation of racialization and the creation. It is what in the epistemology of the South, the Ventura calls the monocultures, the monocultures of the linear time, monoculture of knowledge, a monoculture of capitalist productivity, of the linear time, of the idea of the vellum. And on the other side of the line, you will have different criteria of vellum. So if we go to Patricia Hill Collins and to the black families, we, we see also a lot of discussion on this. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is to challenge our criteria of validation of what is the relevant knowledge, of what is the relevant law, of what is the relevant conception of nature. Because if we, have, if we learn from indigenous conceptions of nature, we might much better think how to develop in a different way or not to develop. In fact, why does develop must be a, 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 a concept uh, or must be an unquestionable uh, concept. So uh, the idea is uh, to make, uh, uh, in order to analyze uh, uh, the future, to do a this ecology of knowledges, to do this ecology of knowledge in which we could uh, try to question 
create questions and to answer to it, we would take into account not only what we find in this fishbowl of knowledge, of rights, but all of these different conceptions from which we can learn and with no hierarchies. Uh, because many times uh, what, what we find is that uh, uh, one of the things that we, we did in the project, and it goes back to the Spivak questions, uh, who can speak, can the subaltern speak, and that was the thing that we used to, uh, that, we, that we listened from the Roma communities, there was this incredible woman that told me, okay, it, 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 she, she completely challenged the project at all, and I really appreciated that because I thought she was right, because it was a very Eurocentric project, and she said, uh, well, you want you are doing a project on Roma representation. Why am I not included in your project? Why are you always talking? With Roma people in Portugal, they are always talked about. They never speak uh, uh, for themselves. So this would be a plurality of voices speaking for themselves with no hierarchy uh, between them. So we could have this plural. Uh, lack of ideas, of knowledge, in order to think what the future uh, uh, would be. So.